Hava Kari, director of MCTC, to give an opening remarks. Hava, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna. <coughs> um, welcome, everyone. I have the great pleasure today to introduce a dear friend of our center, Professor Muli Lahad, uh, who is a well-known Israeli psychologist and psychotherapist and psychotrauma specialist recognized for his creative methods of intervention and treatment of stress. He is founder and former director of the Institute of Drama Therapy and founding president of the International Stress Prevention Center at Tel Chai College in Kiryat Shona. Um, professor Lad is a professor of psychology at Tel Chai College and was visiting professor of drama therapy at Surrey University of England. Professor Lahad champions the application of creative approaches such as drama therapy and bibliotherapy in the prevention and treatment of psychotrauma. He developed the integrative model of coping and resiliency, basic PH, and the CFAR CBT psychotrauma treatment protocol adopted by practitioners worldwide. This protocol centers on people's natural coping mechanisms. Professor Lad has practiced his methods in the immediate aftermath of disasters such as the 1999 earthquake in Turkey in the United States while dealing with the aftermath of September 11th and in Sri Lanka and Japan following the tsunami. He is the author and co-author of 35 books and the recipient of numerous awards from prestigious institutions around the world. Professor Lahad has worked with our center, training professionals from all over the world. We have the great honor and pleasure of having Professor Lahad with us today. Thank you so much, Muli, for agreeing to take on uh, this venture today at this such important time when we need resilience more than ever. Uh, thank you for being with us. Tadarava. Thank you, Chava. Thank you very, very much. It is my pleasure to uh, come back and teach for you, despite the fact that I'm doing it uh, online and not face to face. But I hope that in uh, not the very diff uh, distant future, we will be able to meet face to face with uh, students and colleagues from around the world. And uh, well, I, I hope for it very, very much, though, you know that uh, in my college, we are already teaching face to face. So this is a great change and uh, really uh, <laughs> a great experience. All right, my, my talk will be as uh, I've uh, ri written it, thriving uh, during stress and crisis, the art of coping and resilience. And have already told you who I am so we can right away go into the presentation. So, um, ju just to add the, the technical details, so those who have questions, please write them on the chat and then we'll uh, move it to Professor Lad. Thank you. Great. This is exactly what I wanted to add, but this is great that you did it, Anna. Okay, then. So, um, why that is, does that not work today? Hold on. Okay. So, the first thing I would like to address is the question, why are we so concerned and when did crisis turned into a time of great disagreement, confusion, or suffering. Because you see, originally, this word crisis does not mean something extremely bad or only bad. In Greek, the term crisis is a turning point in a disease, which means it could go for a better or, of course, for worse, which is the moment the person with the disease could get better or worse. Another meaning, uh, meaning for in, in Greek is to withstand. Of course, some of you know that in Chinese, the same uh, uh, um, statement or the same uh, concept actually uh, is composed of two characters, signifying, sig uh, sorry, signifying a danger and opportunity respectively, respectively. And in Hebrew, it's very interesting that the term for crisis is either maternity seat and also supplies. So, the potential for thriving was recognized by the uh, ancients already when they were talking about crisis. It means a turning point or a place where some hope is possible or some, uh, I would say, opportunities are within this uh, uh, situation. Now, let's look for a moment at what we call 
the trajectory or the diagram of what happens when we face the, the case that we are all uh, faced in, uh, during uh, the year 2020 and many of us are still facing, and this is COVID-19. Now, uh, this diagram is actually uh, based on our, uh, our work around the world and uh, have already mentioned that we have worked almost in every crisis worldwide. But I would say that uh, it is also a, a very known chart that CDC has used in other uh, uh, um, organizations. So what we know is that right after an, an incident or in the event, the impact is that there is a reduction of our ability to cope, but very quickly, and that's why we call it the heroic period, uh, we come to this uh, uh, um, energy of wishing to uh, to cope and and do everything to uh, somehow uh, get uh, get uh, out of the conditions or the, the stress or the crisis, and that is a, a, a time that we call honeymoon because everyone is doing their best to manage the situation. But that is a very short period of time, I should say, between weeks, uh, not more than a few months, and then when we are coming out of that, and that probably will. Uh, be the first phase of, of uh, the COVID-19, uh, sometimes between March and May uh, 2020, we're moving into a next phase, which is inventory. And you can see the decline here. In the inventory, we ask ourselves, what have happened to us? What are, what's going on? Are we not managing it? What should we, we, we come up with? What sort of coping do we need in this kind of uh, situation? But again, the longer the crisis uh, uh, continues, we are getting into the disillusionment phase. Here you'll have lots of, of reaction, one of which will be disappointment, uh, people feeling bewildered, people are not uh, uh, are feeling fatigue, depleted of energy and angry. So you can see on the one hand what we call help, uh, helplessness, and on the other hand, rage and, and anger. And altogether, they don't know what will happen. Now, the, the road to recovery, as you can see, is a kind of a graph that comes up and down, like what I'll uh, refer to in a minute, the mountain climbing effect, which means we need to uh, understand that it is not a clear uh, upsailing or climbing, but there are, of course, moments that we are <coughs> um, uh, somehow uh, um, um, find that the, the solution is not yet there, and we need to um, uh, pull all our resources together. If you see the white line at the bottom, which I'm now pointing with my cursor, <laughs> it is a white uh, line here, which means if we don't cooperate, if we don't do things together, which I'll come to in a minute, it'll be very difficult to climb out of the situation, and we might dwindle around with a long period, sorry, with a long period of time, that will be a longer period of recovery. And that's basically a main challenge to authorities, uh, but also to local organization and to communities. Now, what I came up with is that we have thought to start with, it's a, what we call a short distance. Then we thought maybe it's a little bit longer, maybe it's a marathon, but now we understand, and that's what I'm going uh, to, that we probably are now thinking about mountain climbing. And I want to tell you what's the mentality we need for the different phases and uh, what is needed now. So you see, when we're talking about short distance, uh, the short distance runner, has to use his efforts with full energy in the expectations of reaching the goal the fastest. A sprinter is endowed with uh, fiery <coughs> power, muscle strength, and reaction speed. Runners have the ability to focus the full, full power on a very limited amount of time. That means for a short period of time, all your energy, and you are getting to the goal. Marathon, on the other hand, is a long-term effort. Uh, and here, the, the runners have to calculate efforts and distribute the power until the last phase. They can't just stop, <clears throat> and they can't use uh, a lot of energy to start with. They have to really think clearly how they manage their energy. Slow pace, but the goal and the end are clear. 
<clears throat> it is easier to increase the running distance than to improve speed. But these two characteristics require the same patience and forbearance. The tenacity of confidence in the ability and resilience to meet the goal. All of these are components that much, uh, are much more connected to marathon. But when we are getting into uh, the, the, the concept of, of um, uh, mountain climbing, we have to think about it in a different way. Do we understand that we should move to the mentality of mountain climbers once we see that the COVID-19 has this um, fluctuation, ups and downs, and that the road is, is not really clear. And, and I am using Dickinson, one of the uh, uh, climbers that uh, reached the Everest, who says, do not think of the mountain, think of it as a future, as a uh, unknown land. And he says, it seems quiet. That means when we feel that things are quiet, but one mistake can kill the, uh, the team. It seems calm, but one storm could turn the plans around in an instant. That's why he says, pay attention to the small details. The future is unknown. Once you think you have the right formula and a team that knows how to implement it, you are going to die because the formula runs you instead you running it. And the most important part for a mountain climbers versus the two other methods of running is that there is a need for teamwork and communication that are extremely important goals. And not only that, successful team, uh, teams that can talk, dare, and think together how to get more oxygen. I think this is a great metaphor to ask ourselves, how do we manage a long and still an unknown uh, ending to, to this COVID-19? Because actually we don't know if one of the variants will not uh, be the one that uh, the vaccine is not really effective. We still are in this mystery. Now, why are we so scared of uncertainty? It's interesting to say that we human beings hate to be without control. We want to be in control probably because we are the only creature that is aware of the fact that there is a big unknown in our existence. And that's the fact that we are the only animal on this planet that knows the future and knows it in the far, hopefully far future for each and every one of us, we will not be. This idea, this concept of our finality, of our vulnerability is coming to our awareness very, very early in childhood. Some research will say it is at the age of three. Some will say it is the age of nine. Nevertheless, it's a notion that we don't want to pay attention to all the time because it's scary. Now, some of you will say, yes, but you know, birds are migrating, birds are nesting, indeed but this is an instinct. For us, we have future view that can be very, very helpful, which is our dreams of what will come true, what we'll do, our summer vacations, our getting married and all that. Same time, the, 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 the uh, ability to forecast and see future also, unfortunately, as I said, causes us stress and distress because we are able to think about different consequences and that might, uh, I would say, cause distress and sometimes other symptoms. So we would like very much to control the uncontrollable. We hate to be out of control and in uncertainty. I'm sure that some of you are holding, uh, hope, uh, 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 most of you have, what we call life insurance. But as you all know, life, we cannot really insure our life. We basically insure our death in this uh, insurance. But who will buy a death insurance? So we call it life assurance or life insurance. And, you know, we, we invest it very, very happily. And, and most of us do that. But 
truly we will not be the ones to enjoy the the money once it will be uh, um, the time to receive it because we will not be there still we would like in some way to reassure ourselves about something we don't have any control of so as we are the only being that is conscious and aware of our finality we're trying all the time to push it and not to be aware of it and somehow to um, get this sense that there is some control. It's interesting that a, uh, John of Bullman already in 1992 have done a uh, international uh, study on what is the basic uh, uh, assumption of people about the world and themselves. And despite the fact that she has done it in many, many cultures and places, she found that people believe that the world is fair, reasonable, and if you do the right things or good things, you will inherit good. Some of us might think, oh my God, she's so naive. We know that bad things happen to good people. But at the same time, I want you to ask yourself, is there someone dear to you and that person have gone through something terrible? If this idea, this thought, oh, he's such a good person, she or he does not deserve it, probably John of Bullman is also right about you. But I dare to say that this is just one of the things that help us to cross between what I call uh, today and tomorrow, because we need a story. We need to say something about the need for stories. The human race is probably can be defined as the storytelling animal or entity, whatever you want to call it. We need a story to make sense of things. Some of us confusing computer with human brain. Our brain is in many ways more sophisticated than nowadays most sophisticated computer. But one thing we need to know, our brain is not a computer. We cannot process big data. We cannot do that. We are unable to process the, the intensity and amount of, of, of stimuli that, that comes uh, uh, to us. And so we need a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. In recent research, they found that, in fact, there is a a uh, place in the brain, uh, uh, an area in the brain that is responsible, and I even say hungry for stories that have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And one of the stories that we somehow develop without any teacher teaching us, without any parent telling us, is the story that I call the story of continuities. That need for us to feel that yesterday predicts tomorrow. In fact, we are taking risks all the time. By that, we actually, in a way, uh, uh, refute this sentence that yesterday predicts tomorrow. But I would like to tell you that when you take a risk, when you decide on something that is not in your, I would say, natural path, you have a fantasy or some experience that says to you, you can take that risk because you have the illusion, the hope that you are in control. One of these things we're doing on a daily basis, it's called driving. We all know that we are driving in cars that the uh, tin, the, 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 the cover of the car is, is very, very thin yet, we're driving 90 kilometers or 80 kilometers, and we don't always think about the fact that uh, the person driving in front of uh, on the other uh, direction is also driving 80 or 90 kilometers an hour. And we are only sitting in something very, very thin in the fact that it is not made of steel or, or, or any other thing that is so uh, uh, strong. Why do we do that? Because we feel in control. We feel that once we are holding the steering, we are in control. Another thing, of course, it helps us that yesterday we did that, so it must happen today. 
May I ask you another question to ponder, to think about? You see, I doubt if any of you have in your diary something that says, tomorrow I'll have a flat tire. No, we don't uh, envisage bad things or crises or things that are happening without us choosing them. So basically, we would like to feel that when we plan something, that what we plan will actually mat uh, 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 materialize. And that is yesterday predicts tomorrow. Now, this story of continuity is very important to us when we are looking at crisis. So let's see what does it mean? What are the four continuities that helps us to pass from today to tomorrow? It's the cognitive reality continuity. It's the role and function continuity. It's the social interpersonal continuity and the personal historical continuity. I'm going to explain each and every one of them. But I want to say right now, they are all part of our life. They are ever changing, but somehow we manage to stabilize them and to move from yesterday to tomorrow. Now, what does it mean, the cognitive realistic? That means all the laws, all the procedures, all the data, and it lasts, oh, uh, 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 and this is like, it's, it's including the experience, the routine, all the things that we are uh, usually taking for granted because they happened yesterday and they probably will happen today. The next one is what we call the role and function. And these are our various roles in life that usually last over a long time. And this is the first time I'm going to ask you uh, what I call an opinion poll. So those of you that are online are uh, actually invited to do the poll with me. I'm asking, can you put up your hand if you are the first, the firstborn in your family? Just put up your hand. Firstborns, your hands up. Okay. Youngest, please, your hands up. Those in the middle, your hands up. All right. Now, well, I've seen one person that put his hand three times, so probably it's a, a, a single child. So never mind. It's both the begin, the, the oldest, the youngest, and the center. Okay. But what I want to share with you is that... Um, the moment you were born, I mean, your, your order of birth is very much influencing, at least to, according to Alfred Adler, things about your relationship and the role you're entering. So the firstborns are usually always, I should say, are always, uh, always born to giants. There is no firstborn that wasn't born to giants because there are no uh, other size creatures, which means brothers, siblings, uh, and, and sisters around him. So the concept was that if you're born uh, to giants, first of all, you identify with their, I would say, um, uh, ethos, with their norms, and you take a leading role because very soon you have the, the, the younger ones to lead. That is why, by the way, the Israeli Air Force for many years uh, actually um, was choosing pilots. And one of the items that they were looking in the person's history is his uh, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, order of birth. And they actually preferred many years ago, nowadays they don't, uh, the firstborns. Now, what about the younger ones? Well, your older sisters and brothers have already paved the road and your parents are very, very tired. And so you have easy life, so to speak. And why are the center ones, the middle ones, so resilient? Because just imagine, on the top they have the older person knocking on their head. From the bottom, the younger ones is pushing their, uh, and pulling their legs. And so they have to develop the resilience. So you see, this is one of the roles that we are almost, I would say, born to. But along our life, we are, all of us are exposed to other uh, uh, roles. And because roles are including 
their cognitive realistic part, which means what do I do in my role? Do I understand my role? Plus the actual functioning, it gives me a sense of security that yesterday predicts tomorrow. I'm sure that many of you who've changed roles or changed uh, uh, workplaces in recent years, remember that even though you have chosen to change your uh, uh, place of work, uh, the first few months or maybe the first few weeks was kind of uneasy because, because you didn't know all of the rules and routines of the place and you didn't know their functions or what is actually expected from you in your role. The next one is the interpersonal social uh, circles, which as a, a continuity, which means the social circles that are around us, that is family, extended family, relatives, colleagues. And that is also something that gives us a sense of security. And you see, when we are in distress, when we are in crisis, we usually would like to be in a known group in, in, with people we know. The historical and personal continuity means what do I know about myself, my values, my self-image, my self-concept, my self-esteem, my belief about the world, about myself, being optimistic, being pessimistic. All of these are things that, again, are quite continuous, and they give me a sense that yesterday predicts tomorrow. Now, we know that there are times in our life that these continuities are somewhat disrupted. One of them is uh, uh, when, when we are going on to retirement. Of course, our daily routine has changed. Our role is, has changed. The interpersonal and social uh, continuity, we, don't, we no longer see the colleagues we work with. And the big question is, am I happy about it or am I distressed and feeling that all these sensation and sentiments that I sense are completely alien to me and I'm so depressed and, and uh, desperate uh, because of that situation. So you see, you know these continuities on an, uh, uh, from our life experience, and you can take that to moving from uh, kindergarten to elementary school and to every passage. However, usually we are able to stabilize them. But when we are talking about the uh, <coughs> COVID-19, Basically, what happened here is that, uh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah. What happened to our continuities during COVID-19 is basically a complete disrupt, uh, disruption. You see, still today, we don't know all the procedures and all the laws and all the uh, 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 routines we, we started off with no previous experience, and I must say that medicine still uh, is not really clear about how to cure it, but only how to vaccine against it. As for roles, many of us are still studying from home. That means that you are at home, working from home, taking care of things at home, and at the same time have to do lots of things, and, and maybe your, your kids are also uh, at home and they need your assistance and so on and so on. Not to mention all those that uh, suddenly they closed down and, and the economic crisis made their, their roles uh, either not really necessary or they were laid off or dismissed. So the role continuity was again uh, uh, disrupted and still. And of course, the most uh, um, uh, affected uh, um, continuity is the interpersonal and social isolate, uh, 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 continuity. And that is, of course, the isolation, the remoteness, the, the contact through, uh, through screens, the prohibition of face-to-face -face contact. That means this very, very important continuity that usually gives us a sense of security suddenly was also uh, disrupted or affected. And for many people, the historical and personal continuity was affected. All the things about what do I know about myself? How do I feel suddenly? All the sadness, the distress, the worries, pain, sleep and eating disturbances, and mostly the worries about the future. So basically what COVID-19 has done on that concept is that it disrupted or I would say maybe uh, um, uh, destroyed in some cases, those uh, continuities are actually 
the 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 uh, principles that helps us to feel somewhat controlled. No more than, not less than that. It is connected to our greatest fear, which is our finality. And so, the combination of uh, keep telling us about the toll of that disease, the fact that we don't know still how quickly it will disappear, and definitely we don't know which uh, 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 virus is, is going to spread quicker or, 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 or slower, all of that keeps us all the time with this concept that we're still under the threat that we or dear ones to us might be affected and even might die. And that all together with the disruption of the, of the continuities have made a major, I would say, impact on us. But at the same time, when we are looking at these continuities, we can not only think about individuals, but we can also think about communities and organizations because organizations have cognitive realistic uh, continuity, our, our uh, institutions and, 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 and communities and, and, and uh, uh, groups have role and function. We do have role in each group. We do have ru uh, uh, rules in each group. We have uh, our, our subgroups, our co uh, uh, interpersonal and social continuity, and definitely we have the group belief about itself or the image that they have and their sense of what is going to be with them and how they coped in the past with uh, 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 challenges and crisis. But you see, what I actually uh, suggest is that I am painting for you, I'm uh, uh, sharing with you a map, a map for you to advise yourself advise your dear ones and in your workplace use it as a way to understand what's going on and basically i would ask you to look for the uh continue the continuities that are functioning and I, i'll i'll give you the very basic questions for the cognitive continuity to ask yourself are uh, people understand what's going on do they maintain any uh, uh, rules? Do they understand the new procedures? Do they come to the meetings even though they are on, on uh, Zoom or any other uh, uh, platform? Um, do they uh, make any effort to uh, meet the, the um, uh, challenges that, that uh, was put in front of them or the task they have been asked, they have asked to, to do? As for the role and function, do they keep uh, their role? Do they understand what is expected uh, from them in their role? Do they uh, uh, perform according to the expectations and the plans, etc.? And for the interpersonal is how much connection, how much uh, uh, meetings, how many meetings do they actually ask for help? Do they actually uh, uh, communicate things that are uh, uh, in their basic, uh, I would say, uh, um, um, needs, uh, some of, of their basic needs for support, uh, are they maintaining any connection, any contact with colleagues, and of course with family members? And as for the uh, historical continuity, you may ask yourself, what about the, I would say, personal climate? Are they optimistic? Are they pessimistic? Are they feeling uh, uh, distressed and fearful, or are they uh, trying to find uh, uh, some uh, uh, ways to cope and manage their their um, their situation and their emotions? So basically, I would call it checking the mood or checking their their uh, uh, inner climate, or uh, if it's a group, the group climate. Now, why do I say that? Because uh, I would usually suggest to start with the continuities that are functioning and strengthen them. That means uh, we found out in our studies that if you support an already functioning continuity, what happened is that other continuities follow. It's very interesting, but I'm sure that you already noticed that these continuities are interconnected because if you have a clear role, 
you usually also have some interpersonal connection because you have to perform your role many a times with some other people. If you are a, uh, a clear role, you usually will also understand the situation and have your cognitive realistic uh, continuity. So basically, we would say that focusing on a functioning uh, um, uh, continuity is very important because then we might help other continuities to recover. At the same time, we have to pay attention to the disrupted continuities. What is a disrupted continuity? It's a partially functioning continuity. An example, a person that understands what's going on but finds very difficult to uh, uh, take decisions or make decisions to um, uh, adapt to the new routine or to the, to the new procedures. So one way understanding the other part, which is making something with it, is still not really functioning. However, there is also non-functioning or destroyed. That's very, very sad when you find that people not uh, really understanding what's going on, not really uh, are following the, the new uh, rules and, and procedures, not really making uh, any effort to uh, meet others, finding it very, very difficult to function, and on the whole, feeling very, very depressed or depleted. Now, in this case, I believe you need to uh, look for a professional uh, partner or at least someone from your team to connect to that person and try slowly, slowly to help that person build the continuities again. So looking at this concept of continuity, I would say, where is the opportunity? I'm just looking at, I would say, general uh, 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 recommendation. The first is that the prospect lies in our ability to create islands of certainty in the sea of uncertainty. That means to try to maintain or bridge the continuity or routines structure and uh, uh, updated information, logic, make clear every, uh, all, all your decision has to be clear. And if there are new procedures, make sure that everyone is familiar to them. Uh, stress the roles that are essential for business continuity and which must be adhered to because some people see this uh, ongoing crisis as a kind of a situation where everything is unclear. So I can just drift. Drifting is very, very un unhealthy uh, position. Refresh crisis roles, if there are any, and define new roles uh, while striving to share most of that with most people. The means don't leave uh, as much as possible uh, circles of, of people around you that are not familiar with, with the decision or with the new roles and, and instruction. Very important is to emphasize the importance of group support, cohesion, and unifying symbols, even when we are dealing with it on, on Zoom or any other platform. That means you can hold a coffee meeting, uh, like, a, like sitting together whilst your, your uh, meeting is on Zoom, but everyone brings their own uh, coffee and maybe a cake, and uh, then you're sitting and discussing things that are not necessarily to do with your daily matters, but something that helps people to feel a group. Another thing is for in, in some companies that they send to all their employees who are going to meet in this session, something like uh, um, something to drink and something to eat. And once they open the session, everyone has the same food. So they feel that the company is caring about them and then they feel together. Remind yourself that you can do, preserve your values and maintain a dialogue. And that's a very, very important thing. When we are facing crisis, we usually look for what is missing, what has, uh, has changed. But there is a very important question to ask, what didn't change? What is still in my control? My values, my feelings, my imagination, my fantasies are all in my hand. Strengthen believe in the importance and worth of your work. And even if there is a change in our environment, make sure that you are giving yourself and your team confidence that we are doing our best 
even though it might not lead to the best outcome, but to the best we can. Strengthen your confidence that you have been through difficulties in the past and you manage it, instill hope and give encouraging feedback to your team. Hava already mentioned my integrative model of resilience. I wish to share that with you right now. The concept is known as the basic pH. And as you know, we are actually measuring when we want to get a, a good health, we need a balance between our acidity and our uh, uh, alkaline or basic. We need to be in uh, somewhere balanced between the two. We sometimes have it on soap that it says pH, which is the, the, the acidity. And it shouldn't be too acid and it should be also too alkaline. We need a balance between them. This is leading to health. And that's why we use this concept of basic pH. How to balance? What are the kind of, uh, um, I should say, coping mechanism or coping resources that we are using? And basically, I would like to say that resilience is an innate ability that, of course, needs developing and maintenance. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean by that that it's like muscles. We have been born with our muscles. But remember that if we don't exercise, once we face a challenge, we won't be able to use our muscles. So that is exactly the same with resilience. We are born with the resilience because we don't have any other choice but to be resilient. We are the most vulnerable creature on this planet. Just think about it, even now in the 21st century, a newborn baby comes to this world with complete, I would say, dependence on the good faith of those around him or her. The baby has no ability to move, no ability to find food, no cover, no shelter, no defense. The only defense of babies, as you know, is crying. But if you take the history of humankind to 60 or 120,000 years, you would ask yourself, is crying a good defense or is crying was the main thing for the uh, vultures and the, 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 the vicious animal to come and, and, and find this uh, a, a very, very vulnerable creature. So altogether, I would say we are all a miracle because as I said, even in the 21st century, Babies are still coming to the world in the same condition. However, because we are so vulnerable to start with, we have to develop our resilience, which is our ability to cope with situation, our ability to recover despite periodical setbacks. This is an innate, I would say, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, a, a component or, or, or characteristic of us, and we need to develop it and to maintain it. Now, I need to say to you that we're able to be very, very flexible and have a multifaceted coping resources. Now, what is the connection between resiliency and coping resources? Resiliency is a concept of how we manage either bouncing back or bouncing forward. All of this is to do with kind of a concept, but what are the building blocks? And the building blocks are the coping resources. So here comes the only other exercise I'm going to do with you as far as I remember in this meeting. And that is, I would like you to take one minute and one minute only and write to yourself, what are the things that you know help you and it can be uh, a, a whilst uh, a coping with something long with a, a, a personal issue with a family issue with a, a professional issue anything just write to yourself whatever you remember you think you know about yourself that is helpful to you try to get to a list of at least five to eight uh, items okay and here comes the one minute.
Um, Professor Lad, after that we have two questions by mail, so... Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll wait. You will read it to us. Yeah. Just a little longer. Okay. Let's go back to uh, where we are, where we were. Hold on. I probably went to the end, but I'll come back to it in a second. Hold on. What happened? Hold on. I don't know what happened. I'm just need to, I need to uh, put it up again. So just a, a moment, please. Here it is. Is happening here today. Okay, let's see. Something has happened here. It doesn't want to show. Anyway, okay. Uh, would you like me to? Would you like me to upload? No, no, no. no. I'm, I'm using another. That's okay. I, I will be using another. Another. I, I have what you call a standby <laughs> program. Okay. okay, so basically what I'd like to uh, share with you is that we have, hold on, here it is, we have this uh, ability to uh, cope through various channels or various ways. We call it the integrative model of coping and resilience. And I will immediately share with you what it means, but I'll give you a brief uh, uh, I would say a brief on this, uh, saying that B stands for our belief system. That means those people who are uh, usually uh, coping using their uh, belief, that means religious belief or self-esteem or looking for meaning or, or uh, trying to uh, uh, use some uh, um, philosophical concept like what we call psychophilosophy, uh, what doesn't break me makes me strong or whatever. The affective uh, group, the emotional group, is the ones who share emotions. The social group is the one that is using uh, uh, others, being with others, trying to have a role. We'll come to that in a minute. The imagination one are those who are using fantasy and imagination. And the cognitive ones are the ones who are trying to look for uh, uh, solutions, uh, look for uh, um, data, etc. And the physiological one is the one that is using their bodies. I'm going to share with you uh, it in a second. But basically, we believe that every person can have the ability to cope using all these six channels. But let's look what it means uh, per each of these uh, coping methods. As I said, the belief system is people who shared with us that what helps them is hope, self-esteem, 
pray, psychophilosophy, looking for meaning, searching for meaning, look at the COVID-19 as a spiritual experience or some kind of message from nature or from God. Uh, inner locus of control, meaning I am in control of things, I control life, and also mysticism, which is relying on rituals and, and other uh, modes of talisman, etc., that helps us to feel that we are coping. The affective mode means people who are using it to share feelings. They are calling someone, they are using self-writing, they listen to music, they, they are expressing their emotions directly and also indirectly. But what is important is that they are not always sharing what I would call pleasant emotions. They might express anger, they might be very frustrated, but for them, sharing that is part of their coping. The social aspect is those people who are usually mentioning friends, family, meaningful others that are kind of help to them, a uh, role that they want to take a role whenever they are in a group. They would like to be a, in a part of an organization or a system that gives them a sense of coping, a sense of cohesion. The imaginative group is those who are saying, I'm using my intuition. I like to imagine, I fantasize, I'm using humor. I'm using my ability to be creative. That means either use uh, of arts and crafts or improvisation and also divert my attention. And basically, if you look at uh, uh, the situation now, these are the people who uh, a lot of time opt for a Netflix rather than to uh, watch the news. And the cognitive group is the group that is basically using uh, cognition, reality, logic. They are usually trying to think rationally. They plan, they like to learn, they like to gather information and data. They focus on reality. They create preference orders, priorities. They are looking for alternatives and they use self-talk. Self-talk is like an inner uh, kind of list of activities. Do that first, do that second. So they kind of support themselves or cope through this self-talk. Lastly, the pH group, the physiological one. Here you have two, I would say, uh, part of the continuum. One is the action, the active part, and the other one is the relaxing, but all of them is to do with your body. So it means phys uh, sensation, action, relaxation. People who are doers, using sports, walking, cooking, like to organize and make things in order, but also they are using smoke, uh, smoking, eating, and sometimes they use medication in order to cope. And on the relaxing part, they're using relaxation, meditation, yoga, and Tai Chi. Now you see, uh, what I want to uh, uh, ask you now, now that you have done your list, again, I'm going to use the public opinion poll, and I would like you to, to show your hands, or if you want to use the uh, emoji that looks like this, you just saw it on my uh, um, screen or my uh, box here. Now, I want you to ask yourself, in your list, have you found anything to do with belief system, with uh, looking for meaning, with religious belief, anything to do with self-esteem, trusting myself, put up your hand or just show in your emoji. Excellent. Good. Now ask yourself, in your list, did you find anything to do with calling a friend, sharing emotion, uh, uh, being uh, expressing myself either directly by sharing my emotions or indirectly writing to myself, contemplating? Put up your hands now. Okay. Great. Now ask yourself, let let's us first of all see all the hands are disappearing. <laughs> It'll take a minute. Good. Now ask yourself, are you mentioning in your list, did you mention in your list anything to do with taking a role, 
being with people, my family, uh, calling an expert and, and, and getting some advice. Put up your hand if you are in the social uh, uh, channel of coping. Excellent. Great. Don't wait for the hands to disappear and I'll come with my next question. Did you find in your list anything to do with using arts and crafts, being creative, improvise, using humor, uh, looking uh, at a uh, film rather than looking at the news? Put up your hand. Excellent. Good. Now I'd ask you to focus on my next question. Did you find in your list that what helps you is to make some kind of logical decision, to collect data, to make a preference order, to be very realistic, to look for alternatives, to study, to collect information, to learn from others' experiences? Put up your hand. Good. And of course, my final question will be, did any of you find that being active, doing sports, doing relaxation, uh, cooking, managing things, being, uh, uh, I would say, either on the doing uh, spectrum or on the relaxation, meditation, tai chi, yoga side has been helpful to you? If you're on the pH, just put up your hand. So many of you are on the pH. <laughs> My screen is yellow now. Excellent. All right. Excellent. So what have we learned? First of all, that various people put up their hands several times. That means you have various resources. Now, the main issue now is to look at this. Uh, now that you know what is behind this concept, it's not just running or, or being with a friend, but you know the, the, the model. Once you know which channels are the ones that are helpful to you, ask yourself how many of these, I would say, general uh, headers of like cognitive or social or emotional, what do I do to uh, help myself cope through these uh, channels? Am I aware of that? Can I enhance it? Can I add more activities and or more things to this thing that is helping me? Because you see, we are the best, uh, I would say, uh, um, person to ask of what is helpful. Uh, to us. At the same time, I need to tell you that our tendency is to see when we are in distress, when we are in crisis, to see any other ways of coping as not uh, relevant or not effective. Uh, because we tend to cling to the way that we cope. And so if you're a cognitive person, if you're an active person, for you, this will be the way to cope. And when you meet a person that is uh, very emotional and, and very much into uh, uh, religion and belief, you might say, well, this is not a good way to cope. So what I want you to do is, first of all, to appreciate that different people have different ways to cope. And the first thing is to acknowledge what is my way of coping. Then to extend it, to expand it. But then to when someone else is making you really irritable because you feel that they are not using the right coping mode, ask yourself, but what are they doing? Which channels they are using? Because maybe if you understand that and you will be able, I don't know if you will, but if you are able to respond to them on that same coping mode, on that same channel of coping, 
maybe you can reach out to them much better and join with them much better than just always confronting them and saying, my way is a better way than yours. Guys, we are going to finish soon. I would like to take a moment to talk about hope. I think that without it, we can't really manage the, 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 the situation nowadays. So I'm just moving to hope, if you don't mind. So, oh no, what is happening now? Okay, stop sharing and going to hope. Okay, so what is hope? It's interesting that we are sometimes confusing hope with optimism. Hope is the emotional state which pro uh, promotes the belief in a positive outcome related to events and circumstances in our life. The difference between hope and optimism is that hope entails pathways and thoughts to an intended goal. Optimism leads one to expect the best but it doesn't necessarily provide any critical thinking about how we are going to arrive at this improved future. And that's very interesting. This is uh, Cinder's uh, uh, um, uh, model of hope. And what actually he's saying there is that um, hope is the sum of the mental willpower and way power that you have for your goals. And he says, if you want to create for yourself hope, there are three underlying concepts. One is goals. These are the objectives, experiences, or outcomes that we imagine and desire, not just imagine, but desire in our minds. The goals involving hope fall somewhere between an impossibility and a sure thing. Willpower is the driving force in hopeful thinking, which means the energy we want to uh, uh, put into creating this hope, something that we will fulfill. Lastly is the way power, which is the mental plans or roadmaps that guides our hopeful thoughts. And very interestingly, Fredrickson, who wrote a beautiful article called Why Choose Hope, says, hope comes into play when our circumstances are dire, when things are not going well, or at least there is considerable uncertainty about how things will, will turn out. She states that hope literally opens up and removes the blinders of fear and despair and allows us to see the big picture, thus allowing us to become creative and have a belief in a better future. I'm stopping here, and I'm uh, going to receive some questions, and hopefully we'll be able to give some answers or respond to them. So, Anna, anything that was on the uh, email or the chat? Uh, it's interesting that uh, actually it's obvious that uh, when you spoke, you answer most of the question. <laughs> it seems so. Um, but I do have one question uh, that you didn't answer. Just a moment. Oh, now I miss it. E... No, moment. Okay. Uh, it is a time of global crisis, and it's clear that, that there is a need for the entire population to participate in the fight against some common problem. For example, the pandemic of COVID or the global climate warming. This seems to be a challenge in liberal democracy because the political system limits government coercion, thus all depend on stimulating the desired conduct. What do you suggest to stimulate some appropriate conduct without losing the liberty of the citizens? What a question. It's a lecture in its own right. <laughs> I, I would, I would just give you what we call the very, very dense, or what we call in a nutshell, my, my idea. First of all, whenever you are looking at a group or a community, the first thing that most people will say, they will, uh, uh, will tell you is do a needs assessment. And I will tell you, 
do a resource assessment. Hmm. You see, it's very, very mm -hmm. easy to ask what you need. Well, it's very, uh, I would say, if you ask any of our participants here, what are your needs? Sure enough, you will get a whole list of uh, uh, needs that people will, will tell you. But I would say that every group as well as every individual has resources. And if we only focus on needs and in psychology on pathology rather than on abilities and resourcefulness, uh, we're going to be depleted of our own ideas very soon. So the wisdom is not with us. So the first thing I would ask you is to ask yourself, what are the resources? Can we mobilize these resources? Who are interested and in are partners, or I would even use the, the term stakeholders? Can we agree on basic things, not on the big things, on the basic things so we can start to work? Because you see, the main need for people, community, groups, uh, uh, whatever, <clears throat> is the sense of safety. And I would say that the, 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 the thing that has been affected dramatically during this crisis and the following, I believe, uh, economic crisis is the sense of safety. And it is interesting that through my studies, I found that a sense of safety is not always based only on facts, but many a times on your perception. And we found that some communities, when you look at the real, so to speak, assets, they might still not believe in their ability to cope. So enhancing people's confidence, first of all, that they can make it. That's the resource uh, uh, that I was talking to. But second, that we are working together is a very important thing because of course, actual resources, actual things are very, very important. But believe me, the atmosphere, the, the, the perception of ability is not less important. And we know it from many, many studies worldwide that if a community, if a group, if a family, if an individual holding this idea that I can make it and others will come to help, it is already changing the complete understanding and coping with the situation. I'm afraid for the time we have, this is the most concise answer I could give. And I hope <laughs> I tapped on some of your uh, 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 issues that you've raised. Anna, is there another? Uh... Uh, we have two more questions, uh, even three more questions, but they are, I believe, short ones. Uh, maybe you will you will say, um, as a parent and educator, how can we stress within children be dealt? How to deal with the children's stress? All right. Now, I encourage you to go and read more about my model basic pH because you see, an emotional child is basically coping through emotions. And we can uh, teach children, first of all, to identify how they feel. There are many ways to do that. But mostly if it's your own child, you know, uh, and sometimes you say, oh, he's over-dependent, he's nagging, he's clinging. That is not helpful to someone to get all these labels. Instead, hug them, tell them they understand they fearful or whatever and ask them, would they like to do something together with you, which is using this emotional interaction. If the child is very active, making them st sit still probably is not the best way. If it's a very young one, I should give you just one example. Just use some hand paints and take them to the uh, uh, bathroom and, and, and um, allow them to paint the bath or the sink it's washable. Well, what happened, they will express themselves and you will feel, well, I did something physical with my child and also creative. So basically, I would say, teach teachers 
to listen to the basic pH of kids. Not only that, when they want to address some crisis, try to encourage yourself and others to build a program, a project that is catering for all the, 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 the coping channels and not only to the, I would say, uh, most useful one, which is the cognitive, the physical, and the social. Uh, try to use other channels and to see that once your program is out and you're doing it with the kids, every child can find here or her way of coping and by that get a kind of uh, reassuring about the way they cope. Not only that, other children who will see the different uh, ways of coping might work much better from watching their friends using different channels and from you telling them about the different channels. Altogether, I can, you know, in the time we have, only suggest that you will try if you have an access to any English uh, library or uh, to the Amazon. The book is called in English, Basic PH, and there are lots and lots and lots of studies on different places that we use it from uh, schools to communities, to uh, crisis intervention teams, to family counseling and to small to mid-sized businesses. Because as I said, it's not a solution, it's a map to look through it and encourage people to find their way of coping and develop more. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last question, and really it will be the last one because I know that our time is limited. Um, the different channels, a uh, basic page differs from individual to individual. What could be some of the reasons or roots behind it and how to uncover to understand person's coping style and resource? First of all, you're right. We have different types of coping. Some of it is innate, you know, like our, our uh, uh, rhythm, our pace is innate. Some of us are more active. The moment we uh, came to this planet, some are more passive, etc. So this is innate. Our temperament is innate. There are some things that we learn through life, uh, or it could be a, uh, the influence of our parents and family. So. We don't really know why different people develop different ways of coping, but we definitely know how to identify it. And the easiest way, of, of course, we don't have time here, but when we did the courses uh, in uh, MCTC in, in Haifa, I can tell you we did some exercise on how to identify, and I'll give you the, the rule of thumb. It's by listening to the way the person tells you a story or tells you something. Because the cognitive people will usually focus more on facts, on time, on reason. I'm just giving you some, some uh, 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 examples. Whereas the social person will, uh, will mention others, roles, interactions. And the physical one will talk about activities, pain, bodily uh, senses, etc. So by listening to the way the person is sharing how they meet the world by sharing it through stories. I told you we are storytelling animals. You can basically uh, assess and know which way they, they use. Uh, and, and basically, if you're a teacher, and I remember the, the previous question was from a teacher, teachers are very good in identifying the basic pH of students. Teacher can tell you, for instance, this child studies well only when he likes or loves the teacher. Now, we know that uh, studying mathematics or geography is not really a, a case of love and hate. But if the child loves the teacher, he's making good progress. And if he hates the teacher, he's completely uh, 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 failing in this subject. So what this teacher says to you is this, this child, in order to meet the challenges of school, needs an affectionate communication that he will feel that the teacher likes him. One other example is that the teacher that says to you, your child is not doing so well. Once the child is learning with a group or uh, sitting with a group, he is uh, making a much better progress. Basically, the teacher identified that this child social channel of coping is the best one for them to meet the world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So 
it is a, a, a way of either observing just what I said now, or by listening, active listening to the way the person tells the story. May I share with you uh, two, uh, three um, tips to how to maintain your well being? And this will be uh, my last slide. I'm going to actually share with you what we call the um, use of few psychological laws in order to cope with the situation. The first law is the seven plus minus two. It's a law in perception. When I show you various stimuli, uh, you uh, probably will be able to remember um, on average seven items. Some of us will be able to remember nine. Some of us will be, will be able to remember five. And on the whole, some people will find they can remember more and less. But on the whole, this is the average number. It's seven. Now, if that is the case, as we can remember seven items, I would ask you to think about the five things that you know that you are good in or that these things are uh, helping you to feel good, that helping you to feel good. And if you think about these five things that helps you to feel good, the next thing is to ask yourself, have I done any of this in the last week? If you did, go on doing it. If you did not, make sure to do it. The next one is more complex, is the role of 15. The role of 15 is a very interesting uh, finding from social psychology. There was a, I would say, somewhat disturbing question. The question was, if you uh, look at the people around you, Ask yourself which of them, if they will either disappear because they leave or disappear because they died, which of them will make you very, very sad and you will really need uh, uh, their presence. Most people wrote 15 people. That was the average number. Of course, again, you find some people who wrote less and some people who wrote more, but on average, the 15. And the 15 number is not a surprise to us because if we go back to the times that we were gather uh, and uh, hunter gatherers, uh, we probably could uh, use eye contact and, and maintain group co uh, uh, contact with about 15 people. Now the question is here, check up your phone, your uh, check, uh, check our, uh, your, your uh, um, uh, contact numbers and identify five people that if you call them, they will recharge you, not deplete you. The five people that you know that when you call them, you feel better. It will be sometimes embarrassing because you didn't speak to them a long time, but don't worry. And they might ask you, what do you need? And you will just say to them, I don't need anything. I just need to speak to you. I need to hear your voice. Again, if you have these people, and if you have them, did you call them recently? Do you maintain weekly contact with them? Because if not, do that. If you do, continue to do that. The next rule is the binary rule of the brain. Our brain is not able to think about two things at the same time. Now. Unfortunately, negative thoughts are very difficult to get rid of because they tend to stuck in our head and they look for approval in the, uh, uh, in the outside, which means we want to see any proof that our negative thoughts are correct. And that's, I would say, the nature of negative thinking. But what I would suggest to you based on cognitive behavior therapy is to look for a thought or a um, um, experience that when you are focusing on will take you to a pleasant or relaxing idea. Or I would even go back to your smartphone and tell you <clears throat> to look for those images in your gallery 
that when you look at them, gives you a sense of relaxation, says sense of pleasure, makes you smile. If you look at them, you will see that your brain is going somewhere else. Lastly is the role of nostalgia. We are all not really thinking highly about nostalgia, but a recent study during COVID-19 found that the suggestion was to look for five, again, the number five or six songs that when you were young, teenager, you liked to listen to them. The research was um, asking, in the research, the people were asking to listen to it at least five times a week. And the uh, uh, researchers actually uh, measured the dopamine, which is one of the happy hormones we have. In fact, there was a rise in the uh, hormone uh, and people were actually telling they felt better. Now it is probably to do with nostalgia, but even more so because it is music. And music is another natural remedy to help us because with the relaxing music, our brain waves relaxes and with the energizing music, our brain waves getting energized. So it's up to you to decide which sort of music you're using. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Professor Ladd. Thanks a lot for the perspective you gave us. And now basically we know what is the mechanism of crisis? What are, tool, what are the tools for resilience? And I think the most important thing that at least uh, I took from your lecture, it's clear understanding that all of us has an ability to cope with crisis and we only need to find this resource or the tool that serves us and we can do this, even with help of others, but we, 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 do, we do have the ability. It's amazing. Indeed, I would also uh, suggest won't forget the concept of uh, continuity, that it's up to us to make sure that we build islands of resiliency. Now, for any of you who wants to uh, get more information, here is our website, uh, and you can uh, just uh, go there, or you can leave us a question or a, a request, and we will be very happy to help. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, please uh, just uh, take the. Oh, maybe we put okay. it on the chat as well. Uh, can you just give it back again? Yeah. So, so icpc.org. Yeah. So it will be. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. There is a, some. Oh, sorry. No, no, you won't get there. Okay. There is a problem here. Just a sec. I could see that I made a mistake, which is good when you manage to find it. I see. Yes. You see. Uh, now I will put it up. Yes. Sorry. Excuse me. Something the obvious is not. I so see. Yes, PC. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. ICSPC dot org. Yes. Okay. So, dear friends, so copy you the <clears throat> the address and feel free to contact the organization and Professor Loud. And thank you, Professor, again for this amazing, amazing event. And uh, I hope, my dear friend, that you will be able now to cope with crisis because you know what to do and how to do and how it works. Yes. yes. And I just want to ask my group, 